I think God is going to do something a little different. Second Kings chapter two, verse nine. It says, and so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to his servant, Elisha, ask what I may do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha, and how many know that he could have asked him for anything? Elijah was the prophet of God. He was the voice of God to Israel. And he had everything anyone would need. He had money. He had connections. He had all the right doors that could be opened. But his servant said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And what Elijah said to him, he says, you've asked a hard thing. Tell your neighbor, it's a hard thing. He said, nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Father, bless the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, before you're seated, give your neighbor a high five and tell him it's a new era. You may be seated. Many of you know that for the last three or four years, God has been doing something powerful in our midst. When heaven was open in 2019 and we had services before the pandemic where, you know, we were running multiple services as we always do. And the anointing of God was moving in such a way that many of us found ourselves flat on our face before the Lord, didn't we? We, it was many tears. And how many know there can't be revival without tears? There was brotherly love and forgiveness and enemies, sworn enemies in the neighborhoods were hugging. Shoot, sworn enemies in the church were making up. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and tell them I still love you. And even through that pandemic and through that move of God, the Holy Spirit continued to move, didn't he? Who remembers the tent? Hey. And we had said, hey, we're going to put up a tent every summer. You know, we, I don't think we did. Maybe this summer we should put the tent back up. And, and some of you came to the house of the Lord during the tent season. This time we could do the tent with no masks. Come on. And even through the tent, we just saw a harvest. Many of you got saved, gave your life to the Lord, committed your life to God. And then coming back into the house of the Lord, which I believe was probably one of the most challenging seasons for the church. You know, I thought the, the pandemic was hard, but I, I came to find that kind of reopening the church was more difficult. But just recently, as I was praying, and, and I went up to Northern Cal this weekend to spend some time with Pastor Anthony and Helica, they had a revival, and... Uh, I just went up and I said, Lord, just speak to me. Just give me a word. How many know it's important as pastors, we've got to hear from God. I think the church is in trouble when the leaders don't hear. We spend so much time preaching. Can I speak? We spend so much time giving, we don't take enough time to hear. And I went up and I said, God, and, and they asked me to preach. It's like I go everywhere. Hey, will you preach? I was like, bro, like I'm here to hear. I'm not here to preach. Preach on Sunday. Preach here. They even went to the director's training center and they're like, can you preach right now? I was like, dude, like stop. I'm just here to hear from God. And on the plane back last night, I, I heard this little phrase from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said to me, new era. I believe with all my heart that the kingdom of God is moving into a new era. I Googled it. I, I thought, what does that mean? And the phrase new era means a new period in history. It means a turning point. And, and I could say this with all conviction to you, not only as your pastor, but as a spiritual leader in my generation, that we are truly at a turning point. Can you just look at your name and tell me we're at a turning point? I heard it said early in the week, someone said, we are standing between what is now and what is next. To, to stand in a place like that means to stand at a threshold. What is a threshold? It's, an, it's a door. It's in a doorway. It's a piece of metal. And the threshold, you stand on it. You're not all the way through the door. The door is open, but you're still in the doorway. You haven't passed through. 
And I believe that we're at a point in time in the body of Christ, in the ministry, in Victory Outreach, where we're standing on a threshold, where, where we're standing between what is now and what is to come. And, and I want to tell you, there are some great things on the horizon. That's why I share with you that, that, that God is doing something in our midst because there truly are great things on the horizon. I, I believe that if you are in the house of God this morning and you've made a decision to serve Jesus, man, I'll tell you, there's nothing like being born in revival. Because I learned a long time ago, when you're born in the fire, you won't settle for the smoke. Come on, talk to me, church. When you have been baptized in fire, when you've been baptized in the spirit of God, you can't settle for anything else. But I do believe that in our midst, there are two groups of people in the church. I believe that we are standing in between two types of people where we're standing between the complacent and the complainers. Yeah, it's strong. Huh? You're like, wow, shoot, you just call me complacent? He's abusing me in the house of the Lord? But there are so many people that are still complaining about the past and complaining about what's not happening in their life and bickering and fighting and dividing over foolishness. Come on, somebody complaining about what they haven't gotten and what they haven't received. And we're standing between two groups of people, the complacents and the complainers. And then there's the other group, the called and the committed. And what I believe that God is saying to many of us is that if we're going to step into what he's about to do, how many feel like it's time for you to step into what he's about to do? I'm going to wait on you a little. How many believe it's time for you to step into what he's about to do? He's got some big plans for you. He's got some big plans for your marriage. Some big. How many think it's time for me to stop complaining? Stop complaining. Stop being complacent. I, I came on this Sunday morning to tell you that it's time to move towards commitment. Oh, yeah. Come on. Even if you've been here for a day, you know what it is to be committed. Some of you are committed to the things of the world. You've been committed to relationships that didn't work out. Talk to me. You've been committed to some substances. Hey, some of you were committed to neighborhoods and unholy alliances. But I came and tell you it's time to break those commitments and commit to the plan of God in your life. It is a new era. It is a new season. Oh, it is. Oh, hello, peace. Hello, joy. I'm not. Come on, watch out, devil. I'm coming in. I'm coming into everything that God has for my life. Come on and shout in this place if you're ready to step in. Oh, I don't, I don't feel convinced. I, I want to hear a little bit more joy and excitement. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired. Of, I'm ready to step into what God has for me. Touch your neighbor and tell him, stop complaining. Stop, 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 stop. Come on. Do you, do you need a little bit of cheese with that wine? How many think it's time to step in? Touch your neighbor and tell him, forgive me, but I'm stepping in. See, I came on this Sunday morning to tell you that God is waking things up in our lives. He's woken up our prayers. How many have had your prayers woken up? He's woken up our song. How many of you sing louder than you've ever sang before? He's woken up certain things in our life. But on this Sunday, I came to tell you, it's time to wake up your vision. It's time to wake up your dream. It's time to wake up God's plan in your life. See, if we're going to step in, nothing great has ever happened through mediocre and average commitment. You, you've got you've to commit yourself. We would not have gotten this far as a people with small thinking and lukewarm faith. And I, and I think that if we're going to be children of God, how many of you are children of God? You're children of the Most High. Come on, guys. Wake up a little. Come on, Come on help me. I, I, this is the second time I'm doing this. I got one more to go tonight. Come on, how many of you are children of the Most High? You say, yeah, hey, I'm a child of God. Well, then if you're going to be a child of God, you might as well do it with all your heart. If you're going to do great things for him, then you might as well serve him with all your heart. Well, or what's the point? 
What's the point of serving him if we're not going to serve him with all of our heart? What's the point of doing anything? The Bible says if you, if you, if you work for the Lord, work with all your heart. Well, if you're going to be a parent, parent with all your heart. If you're going to be married, be married with all your heart. If you're going to raise children and grandchildren, do it with all of your heart. Come on, if you're going to do the ministry, put your hands to the plow and say, I'm not going to look back. I'm going to do everything with all of my heart because then the Lord will come through. You see, Elisha in this scripture, he desired a double portion of his father's spirit. He saw how God used Elijah. How many know God used Elijah in a mighty way? He saw how God used his spiritual father. And when it was time for his father to go, he, he could have asked him for anything, as I mentioned. But he asked for a double portion of his spirit. Someone say double portion. You may ask, why did he ask for a double portion? Why not a single portion? Well, I believe he asked for a double portion because Elisha had a revelation of the magnitude of his calling. Have you had a, a, a revelation of the magnitude? Ooh, this is good. Have you asked the Lord to reveal to you the magnitude of your calling? The magnitude of your purpose. Come on now. Stop thinking small. Some of you, there's a heavy calling. He saved you for a purpose. I mean, do you realize that when I got saved, everybody was a drunk. Everybody was an alcoholic. Nobody went to church. Everybody was in and out of prison. Everybody was broke. Everybody was complaining. Everybody was crying. Everybody was fighting. There was division. Everyone was getting divorced. But I got saved, and I said, Lord, show me the magnitude of my calling. And today, my children will never have to put a needle in their arm. They'll never have to smoke a joint. They'll never Never do time in prison. Come on, somebody. Have you seen the magnitude of your calling? Do you understand that he saved you with a purpose? <laughs> Elijah had a glimpse of the magnitude of his calling, and he realized that if he was going to step into his calling, how many want to step in? He said, I can't do it unless I have a double portion of your spirit. Ooh, that's powerful. Say double portion. I need not one scoop from Baskin Robbins. I need two scoops. I need two scoops of your spirit. I need two scoops of inspiration. I need two scoops of power. Somebody say amen. amen. See, if we're going to do anything great for God, it's time for us to move past uh, our personal limitations. We've got to move past those limitations. You see, some never fulfill the vision because they're not only distracted, but they are defeated. They're not only distracted, but they're defeated. And what we have seen in this generation and even in some leaders in the church or people that have been serving God is they allow the cares of this life to strangle their destiny. Come on. And I said something in the first service. I'm going to say it again in this service. There's some leaders you're more worried about dating than your destiny. <laughs> and I know you're mad at me. Get mad at me. Get mad. I don't care. You could get mad at me. Write me a letter, email. Don't talk to me. It's okay. But don't you realize when you do God's call and you answer the call, God will send that right person to your life. <laughs> now, some of you are dating. You're like, should we sit closer or farther away? Hear me. <laughs> when you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. When you take care of God's house, God will take care of your house. Come on and help me pray. When you put God first, come on. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in all things. Not some things. All things shall be added unto you. I don't know about you, but I want everything God has for me. I want all of his promises. I want all his destiny. See, I, I've learned that God takes care of his servants. Amen. Touch someone say, he's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you, lonely boy. Lonely girl. Sad girl, you look so sad. Did he break your heart? Gee, that's too bad. See, somebody don't even know that song. But God knows how to take care of your needs. 
when you take care of his business, he takes care of your needs. There have been seasons where I've walked alone. There's been seasons where I've been rejected. There's been seasons where people have turned their back on me. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And God has always watched my back when others wouldn't. Come on, somebody. I think it's time for some of you to start working on you. Come on, somebody. Start working on your calling. Start working on your destiny. Start working on God's plan in your life. And if you do it, God will give you everything you need. Elisha could have asked his master for anything. He could have asked him for money. He could have asked him for influence. He could have asked him for dinner with the king. He says, I don't want any of it. He says, just give me a double portion of your spirit. And the reason he asked him for his spirit is because if he knew if he had his spirit, he can get everything else. The problem with this generation, put on your hard hat. You want everything else before you have his spirit. But I came to shift something in your life. It's a new season. It's a new era. There's a new generation that God is raising up in our midst. Elisha received a double portion of his spirit because he had a revelation of God's calling in his life. He didn't allow the world and the cares of this life to strangle his destiny. You see, I, I want you to know a new day has come. We are in a pivotal moment in time. We are in a time and we are on the brink of something new. I feel it in my spirit. There's been an uneasiness. There's been a discomfort. Come on, somebody. I can't sleep certain nights. Come on, if you sleep good, then maybe you're in the flesh. But I don't sleep good. I'm tossing and turning. I go, out. why am I up? Why can't I settle in? Why can't? Because God says, I'm shaking it up. I'm getting ready to do something new. I'm raising up a people with a fresh wind and fresh water. And there's going to be some fresh faces in the house of God. I'm looking for somebody's house that I could bless. I'm looking for somebody that I can anoint. I'm looking for somebody that I could raise up. Come on, clap. I'm talking about you. Clap like you know God's got something good. See, whenever God delivers a people, whenever God raises up a nation, whenever God sparks a revival, he looks for a willing vessel. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you willing? You are willing. I know you're willing because you're here. Yeah. You're willing because you're here. You could be anywhere. But you're in the house of God this morning. So you are willing. You are willing. You're will- you came curious. You're like, come on, somebody. You're like Nicodemus. You climbed the tree. Say, I just need to get it. I just need to see Jesus. Jesus says, I'm coming to your house today. You're willing. You took the first step. You're here. So that means you're a candidate for God to do something new in your life. God to do something fresh. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. He- you are a willing vessel. Tell your neighbor, thank you. Yes, I think we ought to thank our neighbor for being willing. Because what happens to them affects us. He's looking for somebody that's willing. He's looking for somebody. They said the journey of a thousand miles starts with one small step. So you're willing. God is always looking for a willing vessel. But let me tell you, when God finds those people, he doesn't look for mere organizers. The church is full of organizers. Gosh, it seems like everywhere I go, organizer. Pastor, there's a clipboard here. Just get away from me. They have their phone. Here, Pastor, just leave me alone. Texting me. What do you want for sir? I don't know. The Holy Spirit. Remember, he's in charge, not me. No offense to my team. I love them so much, but sometimes they get on my nerves. How do you know what God wants to do tomorrow? We're not in charge. The Holy Spirit is in charge. I think we got to be a little organized. But what would happen if we went from being organizers to being agonizers? 
See, before we can evangelize, we've got to agonize. The great people of God that he wants to use in this new era, they may not be that organized. Talk to me. Their car might not always be clean. They might have crumbs on the floor. Their office papers might be stacked so high. They may have a hundred texts that they haven't answered. But the reason they haven't answered is because they've been pressing in with God. And they've been pressing in for souls. And they're saying, Lord, I just want a double portion of your anointing. I, oh, God, I just want more of you. Where are the agonizers? Where are the men and women that will pray for their families? Where are the men and women that will pray for the lost? Where are the men and the women that will pray for hurting people? Where are the ones that say, I need a double portion of your spirit? Are you here? Are you here? Are you here? Elijah said, I need a double portion. Because he saw the magnitude of his calling. See, we need agonizers because agonizers are world shakers. My prayer is that those of you that have come to church in the recent days, you might even be here for the first time. You know my prayer is for you? Is that you would be one of those world shakers we've been praying for. Some of you have been coming a year. Two years, two weeks. Are you one of those world shakers? One of those game changers? One of those new era leaders? One of those people that says, I've tried it all, I've done it all, I've seen it all. And I found out that I need a double portion of his spirit. (laughs) I need a double portion of his anointing. Are you here? See, I like to study those old revivals, those old godly generals. We look at the scripture, there's so many people that we can learn from, different characters of the Bible, right? Read Hebrews 11, those who were the hall of faith, shook the world, lived by faith. But throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, there are people that God used. And even in the modern era of the church, in the days we're in, there are generals that have gone before us. Think about John Wesley, the father of the Methodist Pentecost, was filled with the spirit and began to preach. Wesley would look for an open field and 10,000 people would gather around just to hear him preach. And one time he was interviewed and asked, why do so many people come to hear you speak? And he said, it's simple. I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. That's an agonizer. That's not an organizer. That's an agonizer. People would sit in the trees just to get a glimpse of him. And he would warn them, don't sit in the trees because if the power of God hits you, you're going to fall out of the tree, break your neck. That's some compassionate fire. What about George Whitfield? Another general for God who was filled with the Holy Spirit when he couldn't receive a church pulpit in England. You know, wouldn't it be so great to have a pulpit? Wouldn't it be so great to pastor a church? Wouldn't it be so great, all the prestige and rights and privileges of being a pastor. People bring you coffee and they wash your car and they hold your Bible and your iPad and they take your dry cleaning. Oh, what a wonderful thing. (laughs) Hello, somebody. He couldn't get a pulpit, but that didn't stop him. So you can always tell the caliber of a man or a woman by what it takes to stop them. It didn't stop him. He kept on doing what God called him to do. He moved to America as an evangelist. And it is said that in his life, he preached 18,000 times. Some days, some weeks, he'd preach seven times in a week. Come on, imagine preaching seven times in a week to large crowds and small crowds. You're just so on fire. There's such a fire shut up in your bones that you just got to preach. Listen, if you're a preacher, don't, don't wait for permission. Stop. When are they going to ask me, brother? When I when I came up, I preached. I preach. I preach in the green room. I preach in a Bible study. I will preach in the street. I preach. I preach on street corners in the ghetto. I preach to bullhorns. I preach. Come on. I'm a preacher. 
Some of you want to be preachers. Prove it. Prove it. You're a preacher? Say something. The other day we were in the green room with some of the guys, OG guys, OG guys, and all day I was on fire, man, because I was praying. I was on fire. You know those days we were on fire? Like, don't get close to me. I'm on fire today. I'm going to ignite you. And when I'm on fire, I start preaching. I start giving scriptures and quotes. Like, when we're down there, we could be drinking coffee, and if the coffee's good, forget it. It's super anointing. And I, so then all day I was on fire, and then one of the guys came and goes, man, you preaching? Look at him preach, like trying to mock me. I won't say who it was. He's my friend. I go, that's what we do. Aren't we preachers? Aren't we ministers? Shouldn't the word of God be flowing out of us everywhere we go? Come on, somebody. Where are the preachers? Where are the anointed? We got appointed leaders, but where are the anointed leaders? They said when George Whitfield preached in America, it says that that was America's conversion. 80% of the country's conversions came through the preaching of George Whitfield. It was during that time of his ministry that we grasped the motto, one nation under God. Wow. Is when he would preach and he would say, we're one nation under God. And that's something that's not just on our money. That was a sermon. That was a life that was lived. See, God's not only able to use women. I mean, men, how many know God can use women as well? He can use women. God uses women in our church. I'm not afraid to hear a woman preach. We got some women, my wife. We got other women that could preach some of the men under the table. Y'all giving Bible studies. They're pouring out oil. Come on, ladies. Help me out. I'm trying to talk good about you. They're breaking chains and you're giving jot and tittle. Come on, somebody. <laughs> God can use women. Catherine Coleman. In the 1970s, God raised up this young woman to preach the gospel to thousands, millions. She held large crusades. She would lead people in worship. She would lead them in worship in the presence of God. How many know when the praises go up, the blessings come down? And she'd lead people in worship and the power of God would fall. And when the power of God fell, Blind eyes would be open. Miracles, signs, and wonders would begin to flow. People would be healed by the power of God. Let me, let me say something here. You don't always need to lay hands on somebody for them to be delivered. You don't always need to lay hands on somebody for them to be healed. And you don't always need to lay hands on somebody for even for them to get a calling from God. When the presence of God shows up, there is no limit. I thought I was in the right church. When the presence of God shows up, you don't need my touch. You need his touch. And she would usher in the power of God. How many think that's the way church ought to be? God used her. She was an agonizer. She would usher in the power of God. And she would say, God is not looking for gold vessels or silver vessels. He's simply looking for willing vessels. That was a statement she made. And they asked her, they said, you know, what has made you so effective for God? Why is it wherever you go, God shows up in such a way? And her answer was so profound. And I believe it could speak to all of us because when they asked her, why does God show up? She said, God shows up because I simply let him use me in spite of my issues. In spite of the criticism. Imagine being a woman preaching to millions and men getting uncomfortable. Oh, Pharisees getting uncomfortable. Sad, you see. You see, they're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the move of the Spirit. And they're criticizing a woman preacher. She says, but in spite of the criticism, in spite of the opposition, I said, Lord, I'm just a willing vessel. Use me. Where are the people that are willing to lay their life down so the power of the Holy Spirit can move through you? There's no greater joy. There's no greater joy. There's no greater job. There's no greater calling than to be used by the power of the Holy Ghost. They said, why did God choose you, Catherine Coleman? And she also says, she says I don't believe that this mantle was originally for me. He says, I believe that 
this mantle of healing was, an, was originally for a man. But there was a man who said no. There was a man who rejected the calling. That's a hard calling to do healing ministry. And a man said no. So when God couldn't find a man, he chose a woman. Come on, ladies. Come on. We're entering into a new era where God is not looking for appointed leaders. He's looking for anointed leaders. Someone say anointed leaders. What about our own pastors, Pastor Sonny and Julie? our founders of this great ministry, 50 plus years of ministry. Pastor Sidney and Julie are not spring chickens anymore. They're both in their 80s. They're starting to look to see where these mantles can be placed. And their days, they're in their golden years, their diamond years. They're going to finish strong. But they didn't start out so strong, did they? Two young leaders. Neither of them of noble birth, no money, no support. Pastor Sonny would tell, he told me so many stories. I've been with him now for almost well, 40 years. I've walked with him and, and he would tell me so many stories about how he had to believe God for every dollar. He'd even go to different people and, and talk to them about supporting the ministry. I mean, you're talking about a, a couple that started the ministry in project housing in the streets of East LA, you know, their whole family just in a little apartment in the hood. Come on now. And, and you know, their children, all of them committed to the Lord. You have so many people in the church that you won't even bring your kids to church because you don't like how the child, the nursery looks a little stain on the carpet. So you don't want to put your baby there. We become such cupcakes in the house of God. I look at my wife and my brother-in-laws and sisters-in-laws. They're all raised in project housing, sharing their beds, giving their beds to drug addicts. They turned out all right. <laughs> we become so fancy. The church, can I just share my heart? And I'm not knocking it because I we need it. You know, we need this screen. We, we become so fancy and you got so many, you know, nice graphics and phones and nice pairs of sneakers. And, and <laughs> we look so great. Some of you look great. You look great. You should be a model. But you ain't got no anointing. Come on, say it, Pastor. You're like, preach it, Pastor. You look great. Your hair looks good. Your suit looks good. You got those good eyelashes. They're like, ah, I grab you. But you ain't anointed by God. We need some anointed leaders in this new church. We need some anointed, come on, some men and women that have a story. Some men and women that have been delivered, that have been set free, that know what it is to suffer, that know what it is to go through some hardship, through some preparation. Some leaders that don't have position. We need leaders that have power. Yeah. Double portion. Yeah. Pastor Sonny talks about how he would go and, and he would have to, you know, ask people for funds. And, and man, there were times where he was telling me stories that I literally, yeah, he was so sober about it. Yeah, I went to this and one time and, and I'm sitting there and I have literally tears filling my eyes. Filling my eyes in the living room. The, 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 the lows that you had to go to, to go to people and say, will you help these prisoners and help these drug addicts and people who had houses and had money and funds put away that they were just sitting there, exposed, uh, expendable income, just sitting there doing nothing. And so many doors were just shut in his face and I could feel tears in my eyes and tears in my heart and just wanting to blubber cry the, the humiliation and the things that you have to go through as a leader to build a ministry but look what the Lord has done you ought to clap louder 
because if it wasn't for Pastor Sonny and Julie, we would not be here today. We, we just had them here in our service. Not only Pastor Sonny and Julie, but Nikki. All three of them came. And you all were jumping and shouting. And they were just sitting there like, this church is crazy. They were whispering to each other and said, there's something happening here in San Diego. And I remember Nikki telling me, oh, oh, your, your church is too small. Your church is too small. I was getting offended. What's he talking about? Your building. Like, oh, your building. Yeah, you're right. He goes, God wants to do more. God wants to do more. God wants to bring thousands. The power of the Holy Ghost is in this place. They were just here with us. And the other day, I, I told Pastor, he goes, ah, you know, it's hard to go, and I can't preach. I go, you don't got to preach. You don't need to preach. You don't need to say anything. When you walk in the room, your life is a sermon. Everything about you is a message to this next generation. We need leaders that have a double portion of the anointing. in this new era as they come that are willing you see well God can't use me why not why can't God use you God uses me I'm a, I'm a fool I have so many hang ups and issues things that I've had to overcome barriers that I've had to break complexes fears things in my family upbringing but I'm here. I'm here. And I've been here a little while now. I'm starting to become a veteran. I'm up there now. I won't tell you how old I am, but I'm getting close. They say, you look young, Pastor. You look young. You're a cool pastor. You're the coolest pastor in all Victor Outreach. They always tell me that. And I, you know, I don't like that anymore. There was a time I used to like that. Yeah, that's right. I'm cool. <laughs> Now they go, you're the coolest pastor. I go, you know what, man? Don't post that. That's stupid. I don't want to be cool. I want to be anointed. Come on, somebody. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to people get saved. I want to get people, see people get delivered. I want to see leaders rise. Come on, I want to see leaders rise up. That's what I want to do. I'm a grand, I'm a papa now. I'm a papa. Papa Al. And Nona. Nona Georgina. Is that you? Are you Nona? Nona. We're trying to give her a name. Don't call her grandma. And you know, when you get older, you feel a responsibility. I, I look at my children. I love so much and I'm so grateful that my oldest daughter God's doing a work in her life she's been coming Avery she's got so many gifts just like your kids and then now a grandbaby a little grandbaby and, and, and she was crying last night and her tummy was hurting and I'm gonna say, I couldn't sleep I'm all, I said now what are you doing <laughs> poor Z she's learning to be a mama it's a beautiful thing but they're not my only children. You're my babies too. And I said, older, like, come on, Pastor, I'm older than you. I know, I know. But Gary says he's my oldest son. And Gary's gonna be 70. He's still on fire for the Lord. He's still serving the Lord. But in the same way you look at your children and you want to raise them right. How many want to raise their kids, right? You know, it's easier to raise a child than to repair an adult. And I look out here to our church, and I look at you, and I care for you, and I love you. And I know God has great things for you, but you got to let God build you. you got to come into a new, it's a new era, it's a new time. Could I tell you this? I'm not afraid to say it. The kingdom needs you. Needs you. You're needed. Tell your neighbor, you're needed. Why else are you alive? Why were you not killed in that 
violent situation? Why are you not locked up in prison? Why didn't you die in that hospital bed? Because the Lord said, I have need of them. I healed them because I need them. I kept them because I need them. I'm not finished with you yet. In fact, I'm just getting started. Oh, you ought to clap. He's just getting started. Tell your neighbor, he needs you. But when God declares a man righteous or a woman righteous, he sets out to make them righteous. When God declares a man righteous or a woman righteous, he sets out to make them righteous. The devil came to the Lord and the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? Now I'm about to blow your mind. You're like, what? I'm not saying your life's going to be like Job. But the Lord allowed it because Job was righteous. When God declares a person righteous, he sets out to make them righteous. He has declared you righteous. Not because of your deeds, but because of the blood of Jesus. But yet he gets to work on you. And he starts to mold you and shape you and build you. I've been talking to so many people that have even been serving the Lord a long time that have so many things going on in their life that have not been addressed early in their walk. You can't sweep it under the rug anymore. You can't. God will pull the rug. He'll throw the rug and say, deal with this stuff now. Deal with this stuff now because I want to use you in this new era. Who's ready? Who says, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to clean house. Come on. I'm ready to clean up some of my mess. Come on, somebody. Who, who says, I got to work on me? Oh, come on. I got to work on me. I can't work on my spouse. I got to work on me. I can't work on, I got to work on me. If, if, if I take care of God's business, God will take care of my business. And that's how we got to go. That's how we got to come to the altar this morning. We got to come. And say, Lord, give me a double portion of your spirit because of the magnitude of my calling. Big calling. Big calling. Big trials. I know it's not exciting. You're like, oh, man. I got saved not to go through trials no more. No. David said, it was good for me to be afflicted. Because through the trials and through the testing... He makes you stronger. He makes you better. He takes you higher. You know why God raised up David? I just says, I want to be raised up. I want to be used by God. You know why God raised up David? The scripture says that he loved the lambs more than he loved his own life. So many leaders want to be leaders, but you don't even care about the people following you. Now you say, that's not true. I go to eat with them. Yeah, but in tough times, you want to run. You know why me and Georgina don't run? Yeah, it'd be easy to run. We could have ran during cancer. We could have ran during the baby's death. We could have ran. There was a lot of opportunities to run. But you know why we didn't run? Not just because of God, not just because of our calling, but because of you. He said, if we run, what's going to happen to the people? If we give up, they're going to learn to give up. If we throw in the towel, they're going to learn to throw in the towel. If we quit, then they're going to become quitters. They're going to say, well, my pastor quit. Why shouldn't I quit? why God raised up David because he took care of his father's sheep when he went up against the Philistine they said who are you you're just a boy you, you, you don't know nothing you don't even have any armor he goes when I was in the field I killed the lion and I killed the bear and just the way the Lord took care of business there the Lord's going to take care of business here because the Lord's got me covered the Lord's got my back the spirit of the Lord is upon me I'm in a double portion of his spirit come on clap for the Lord in this place we want some anointed leaders in this church are you ready are you ready The bigger the plan, the bigger the anointing. The bigger the plan, the bigger the power. And if you've been going through trials, who's been going through trials? Let me see it. Oh, yeah, I know. I know it. I can feel it. It keeps me up at night. I can tell. But I say to you, good. 
good you're going. I'm glad you're going to trials. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Sift them up. Sift the people up. Get all that stuff out of them. Come on, purify them. Strengthen them. Anoint them. He is faithful, church. He's building you up and he's making you stronger in this place. And I say it with love. But if you say, Pastor, I can see it now. I can see what God's trying to do. He's got a big plan for me. And I'm going to let him build me. I want to be that Elijah. I want a double portion of his spirit. Then I want you to run to this altar. I want you to throw those hands up. And I want you to say, God, use my life. I give myself away. I give myself away. Come on, sing that. Hey. Come on, Catherine Coleman. Come on, Sonny and Julie. Come on, be one of those anointed leaders. Be one of those anointed leaders. Give myself away. Hey. So Fill up these altars. There's some space up here. Come on up.